Good evening to everyone here in Brussels and good evening to everyone following us online. Welcome to the third edition of the Megalitsi Nizilski Prize, Ceremony for Aspiring Journalists. The prize rewards journalists at the beginning of their career. Journalists that show great potential in journalism and a strong attachment to the values of the European Union. At the same time, the prize honours the memory of Antonio Megalizzi and Bartek Pedro Orent Nizilski, two young European journalists with a strong attachment to the European Union and our values. Sadly, their lives were cut short because of a terrorist attack in Strasbourg just before Christmas in 2018. With this prize, we continue to cherish their memory. I would like to thank their family and friends who are here with us tonight as well. Four young journalists have won the prize in the past editions. In 2020, the winners were Anastasia Lopez from Austria and Francisco Cezinanda from Portugal. The 2019 winners were Karolina Simkova from Czechia and Thea Mihanovic from Croatia who will be the winner here in 2021 for the Megalitsi Nizilski Prize? This is what we're about to find out. We are here today with us, six finalists for the Megalitsi Nizilski Prize. They were selected from among 354 applicants from the European Union and our neighboring countries. So we can safely say that you are among the most promising young journalists here in Europe. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Martina Pagani. I'm from Italy. I have studied journalism in Turin and now I live and work in Milano. Welcome, Martina. You've been involved in a project of hate speech monitoring. What's your advice? How can we fight hate speech in online media nowadays? I think we as a journalist have to start using the correct words or expressions when referring to like migrants or minorities or also women, like using um, a refugee or asylum seeker instead of immigrants or using the active form instead of the passive one when we are talking about a man committing violence on a, a woman. I've actually done a project about that. It was financed by the European Commission. It involved eight uh, radios from around all Europe and it was called Respect Words. So, yes. Thank you, Martina. Hi, uh, my name is Irene Barahona. I'm from Spain. I study audiovisual communication in the University of Salamanca and now, uh, fortunately, I work as a journalist too. Um, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. As a correspondent, you mentioned that you have been doing mojo, mobile journalism. Do you see that as something in the future of journalism? Of course, mojo is an opportunity for journalism. It gives us the opportunity or the allows us just to, to create new paths and new, new ways of journalism, new formats to explore uh, our own work and just to get new audience uh, tell new stories, which is always good. Thank you, Irene. Hi, how's it going? Uh, my name is Jack. I'm 22 uh, and I live and work in Dublin. Thanks. Welcome, Jack. You've already done real investigative journalism on a topic as complicated as drug abuse. What have you learned from that? What has it taught you? Uh, yeah, that was uh, actually a really interesting project that I did uh, not too long ago for the Irish Times, and it was basically looking at cocaine use in Dublin, which is very high relative to the rest of Europe. And I felt it was a really underreported phenomenon. And I think that's kind of maybe some of the value added you can bring as a young journalist is that you're, you have a perspective on things and you have maybe sources in places that more, uh, more established journalists maybe wouldn't have. So I think that was, yeah, it was, that was essentially what I got from that. Thank you, Jack. Good evening, I'm Francisca Pesche. I graduated in Erasmus Mundus Master in Euroculture last year. And since then, I'm working as an editor and journalist in a weekly magazine in Luxembourg. Well, welcome, Francisca. You did a research trip to the Republic of Moldova. How did that change your perspective on being a journalist? Great experience. Um, maybe there's two points in... Uh, way that I that it changed my journalistic view but also myself because um, 
From a journalistic point of view, I noticed there that everywhere is a story to tell. Like even if the, in the uh, in places in rural places where nobody ever heard about, um, there are people who have interesting stories, interesting lives. Even though they are not ministers, they are not a media, they don't do any European co-funded project. They are just persons, humans who have still an interesting story to tell. And maybe the, sec the second thing concerns the European Union and our image of the European Union. Um, because with all the great achievements that the European Union does in its member states and also in neighboring policy, um, it still does create borders. And that's what I saw very much in Moldova, because everyone in Moldova tries to get somehow into the European Union to work and to gain money to support their children. Thank you, Francesca. Good evening. My name is Daniela Horvath, and I am based in Budapest, Hungary. Daniela, you've studied both in the European Union and in the United States. What are the differences that have struck you in those both two systems? Yes, indeed, there were some uh, differences that I experienced. Um, to begin with, when I was an undergraduate student, student I studied economics, and uh, I worked also as a part-time journalist. Um, and as I got more mature, I graduated, um, I realized that I want to focus more on journalism. So when I went to the United States, I could really focus on that, and I started to learn storytelling and documentary filmmaking, so it was a completely different mindset that I was in. Another interesting difference that I would like to highlight is the way that the campuses are set up. Um, so in Budapest, Hungary, the way our campus looked it was much more integrated into the city life. Um, it's a very old building that everybody knows. There's a market right next to it. So it's part of the city landscape. We breed together with the university um, students. Whereas in the United States, it was more like a separate entity. It was more like a city within the city. Um, there was a market, a post office, and multiple libraries on campus. It was, it was like a separate um, small country, and the students, we were the citizens of it. And also the curriculum was a little bit different, the way it was structured. Um, in Europe, uh, my program was more focused on subjects, whereas in the United States, it was more um, project-based. But I would say, despite all these um, differences, that um, during both of these um, experiences, I really felt that we students are really the same at the heart. We have similar challenges, similar mindsets, um, and I'm really lucky that I have this diverse experience that I could bring back with myself to Hungary and, and to practice this in my daily work. Thank you, Daniel. Good evening, everyone. My name is Clemence Maquet. I was born and raised in, in France, but I study today between Italy um, and Russia in St. Petersburg, what we call global governance and international law. Thank you, Clemence. You are also an ambassador for the Antonio Megalizzi Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the foundation is doing and what your work is there? Yes, I have the immense honor to be one of the 30 ambassadors uh, that got trainings by uh, EU experts, uh, members of the parliament, and great teachers in the university in Italy. I felt lucky to be one of those uh, that got this training about the European Union, its institution, its values, and its history. Because today, talking with my peers, with my colleagues that I are here, we got to realize very easily how um, we are not trained today in academics. Uh, and there is a real gap between the European Union and its citizen, its youngest ones, that are actually the future. So the foundation is, is basically working on that, on forming the future of Europe the, the youngest citizens, to teach them how to, to get a critical uh, sense, to read in the news, to know about what the European Union is making for them. And I'm, I'm really honored to be uh, working at bridging this gap. Thank you. Well, welcome to you all. And we will soon find out who the two winners are. But I think you've all already showed us the great experience you have. Now, before we get to the prizes, I have the honor to invite here Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, the European Union Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms. Commissioner.
the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I'll stand up. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, dear uh, family and friends of Antonio Megalizzi and uh, Bartek Nidelsilski, we are gathered here today to honor the memory of these two young men, and especially to honor their values and the things they stood for. We honor Bartek and his tireless promotion of respect for diversity. We honor Antonio and his tireless promotion and training of young journalists like you. And you honor their just commitment to a free press. And this is more important today probably than in any other period of our history. These values are our values too our common European values, and today, they are in fact more important than ever. A free press in the very, is the very cornerstone of democracy. It is essential that citizens be well informed by journalists who communicate clearly, impartially, and fearlessly. Not seeking to please a particular group, or to exclude a particular group, but looking for the truth. Once again, during the COVID crisis, we have seen the importance of accurate and informative media. And it is important to think of the future of journalism and to support and nurture young journalists, as Antonio did. A free press, like all the instructions of democracy, must not be taken for granted. We must water the plant of democracy if we want it to continue to benefit from its fruit. And our commitment is more than just words. It is with great pleasure that I announce again today, again in honor of Antonio Megalizzi, and Bartek Nidalzilski, another round of support for media. We will provide seven million euros to support editorially independent reporting about cohesion policy. We call, the call is open to media organizations, to universities, to communication agencies, and to other private entities, as well as public bodies. I underline that in this reporting, you will have full, I repeat, full editorial independence. Europe needs good friends, but sometimes the best thing a friend can do is to point out a mistake. I myself have sometimes played the role of Europe's critical friend. So we will not censor you if you do the same. Beneficiaries will see 80% of their costs covered, up to a maximum of 300,000 euros. And although we anticipate that most grants will be much smaller, as an indication, last year we distributed an average grant of around 50,000 euros to 99 beneficiaries from all across Europe. The deadline for applications is the 11th of January, 2022, so a couple of weeks away. <laughs> More details are available, of course, on the website of the European Commission's Department for Regional Policy. I will conclude with a short, short message to the families and friends of Antonio and Bartek. We know that nothing we can do and nothing we can say can remove your pain or your loss. But we hope that you will be able to find some small comfort in our attempt today 
to honor these young men and to continue their legacy in the young journalists who are supported and in the young journalists who receive the awards. This is our tribute to them, investing in a free press and democracy and diversity in the Europe that these young men so loved. Thank you to all of you for your work independently of who will win and thank you for continuing to be present and active in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I would now like to invite here on stage Mr. Yunus Omarje, the President of the Committee of Regional Development of the European Parliament. Dear finalists, dear Commissioner, dear friends, today we meet all together for the third edition of the Megalidzi Nidetsky Awards. This day represents for us Europeans a way to honor the memory and remember the bravery of the two young journalists that lost their lives during the Strasbourg attack on December 2018. Antonio and Bartek intervened in front of the gunman. This act of heroism saved the life of many other people. We remember them today as passionate and brilliant journalists. I knew them personally. Antonio was a convinced pro-European, a brilliant person, determined and respectful of difference. Baltec was a bright journalist from the European Parliament. He also became an activist for ethnic, cultural, and sexual minorities. He fought for EU values. He fought for the same values we all share. They were my personal friends. The European Parliament has already announced that its radio studio in Strasbourg will be named after Antonio and Bartek. Today, during this ceremony, we are rewarding all the young and the passionate journalists that follow the step of Antonio and Bartek. We reward you all for fighting for journalism in free societies. We reward journalists that are not scared of publishing their works. We are also rewarding young journalists that cover European and regional issues. And I congru congratulate every single one of you. Still today, there is a lake of interest within public and private media in regional issues involving the European Union. All six of you present here today give us hope for the future. Each of you would deserve to receive an award. And the jury had the difficult task to select one or two or two of you. But whoever wins, I want to say all of you follow your dreams, continue your works, believe in your fight, investigate for the world. Europe and the world need high level journalists as you all. Bravo to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will get to the most exciting part of this evening. We will find out who the two winners are. Commissioner, will you tell us th the first name? Well, well and the first name is uh, Irene Barahona Fernandez. Irene. <laughs> Thank you. 
Congratulations. And Mr. Amarji, the second name. In addition to the uh, statues, yes. you, there will also be another gift. The second name is Jack Ryan. Congratulations to both of you. We'll now take a photo with the commissioner and with Mr. Omarji and the statues. I think this is yes. for you. This is for and you. And this is for you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Bravo. Muy bien. Vous parlez français? Ah, juste un peu. Bon, vous êtes dans la continuité de votre tête. Ça, Check. Que bien. Check vous ici. <laughs> Congratulations to both of you on this prize. You got the statues, you got the good words. You will also receive, both of you, a photo camera, which we hope will help you in your work as journalists. Now, you have been <coughs> honoured with this prize, which, which is here in the memory of uh, Megalitsi and Nidzilski, two uh, journalists who are very enthusiastic about the European Union and about the future of the European project. How does that make you feel? Wow, it's exciting and, and I'm uh, just overwhelmed, sorry. <laughs> but it's, this is an inspiration just to follow the steps of uh, uh, other young journalists and to believe that journalism can make the difference here and um, uh, worldwide. Yes, we th need to think local, national, um, and international. And uh, this I, I think that it's our purpose and just our, our mission is just to work for the citizens and to make this, this society just a little bit better, yeah. <laughs> yes, to be criticism and Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rena. Jack. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of I'm over the moon. I've never really won anything, so it's <laughs> really great to. Um, well, it's, it's kind of a weird career choice, journalism, because I mean a lot of people will discourage you from doing it. It's not the most lucrative profession. Uh, the jobs can be insecure. Sorry, I don't want to be scaring anyone. Um, it's it can be a tough profession, but I just I knew from an early age that. This is what I want to do. Like I don't want to do anything else, even if it's tough. I'm going to try. Uh, so uh, to get kind of an affirmation like this to kind of just keep plowing the path, uh, yeah, keep plowing the lonely furrow. I guess um, that's amazing. Like that's yeah. It's made a. It's really. I'm very very happy. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, you heard the commissioner speaking <laughs> about the importance of the freedom of the press. Now you have this chance. You have a European commissioner in front of you. You have a member of the European Parliament here. Tell us, tell them, what do you think the European Union should do more to protect this freedom of the press that we hold so dear? God. <laughs> I guess... I mean, it's hard. It's hard to know where Europe's authority is bordered in terms of what it can actually do in that regard. Um, it's an essential, essential freedom. Like it really, I love that quote from Thomas Jefferson. I believe it's such a great quote. He said, "I'd rather have a country without a government and newspapers than with a government and no newspapers," because people having the information of what's actually happening in their in their place of where they live. It's so essential that society doesn't really function without it. I mean, n not to be too kind of grand about it, but it is the fourth estate. It's, it's one of, it's an, as much, in my opinion, as much an essential pillar of democracy as the judiciary or something like that. I know it's, but I, re I really do think it's that important. Um, so what can Europe do? I, I don't, I'm not really equipped to answer that question, but I'd say everything it can would be my um, suggestion. I know that I won't name any, but I know that there are some member states where 
the freedom of the press has been um, compromised to some degree. Uh, so looking into trying to curtail that, I would be personally sympathetic to that, those efforts. Um, but I'm not sure, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, I don't know uh, like how to express now, but um, yeah, I think like yeah, we can't like uh, make something or, or not make it because I think that the freedom of, of, of the press is just consistent support it not just a law or, or, or whatever, just um, I would like to, <laughs> to say that uh, just giving uh, like this uh, kind of funds uh, will be really uh, important for the future, just and, uh, and work together with our borders, you know, like this uh, connection and between our um, journalists and I don't know, like, we are better together, and I think journalism and different points of view, and I think Europe for that is like the best place to, to, to be, like to make this exp these um, experiments with media and with journalism. We have like um, a lot of countries, a lot of different points of view, of uh, different schools of journalism, different ideas, and I just think that opportunities just to put all these things together, just to make a uh, journalist from Europe, just not from countries, just from Europe, all together uh, will be just like um, what I really I looking for. <laughs> Well, thanks to you both. I think listening to you, I certainly think that if this is the future of journalism, then we are in good hands here. Our last year's winner said that their goal is to give voice to the voiceless. And you haven't had too much time to think about it, but what is it that guides you in your future work as journalists? And I know that usually it's the journalists asking the, ans uh, asking the questions, so I take the benefit of the situation. Uh, maybe in the future, my goal as a journalist is um, just put in the same level the local stories. Like sometimes we forget about local, we only speak about international and macro, and we forget the names, the faces. And I want just to, to let which is it so uh, voiceless, it's like, um, but to put the face at the same level as international um, news, just to, uh, just to keep at the same position and give the uh, same importance. Uh, yes, and this connection about what we can see in our street at what we can see in our institution. Um, f I was just thinking about it there because I haven't. I don't think I've really consciously thought about that before, which maybe is a bit bad. Um, but I, well, I think that I think that um, I've been reading some interesting stuff recently about how our brains, like human brains, our storytelling brains, like we don't take in information very well unless it's part of a narrative stream or a narrative structure, and then it becomes a lot easier to understand. There's even experiments where people look at a screen and there's little dots moving around just randomly, and people start saying that some dots are chasing others and something is happening. We, like, we, we make stories when they don't even exist there. So really, my aim, I guess, would be to try to use, to try to gain some storytelling skills and try to tell stories of substance rather than trivial stories. Um, I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say that's trivial stories, but I think there's so much content out there which is so great now, and it's, so, and it's all free. You can go on TikTok. And you can just uh, see the most amazing video. Uh, it might be six seconds long, and you flick, and you see another one. It's really hard to write a story that people will read in that context about um, a project being funded, a bridge being funded by the Regional Development Fund in the west of Ireland. Uh, but you can, and if you tell a really, really good story about that bridge being built, then you can compete with whatever's being put out in TikTok or whatever. Um, so I guess. To wrap it up, my my aim would be to try to get take some substantive issues.
that might even be a bit dry in stage usually and try to turn them into interesting stories so people can engage with them. Thank you so much and congratulations again to both of you. Congratulations, Irene. Congratulations, Jack. Thank you so much, Commissioner and Mr. Omar G, for having been here. Thank you to everyone. Uh, this brings our third edition of the Megalitsi Nizilski Prize Ceremony to the end. Thanks so much for having been with us tonight. And congratulations to you all, the finalists. Oh, yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think it's very